Welcome class to week five of our History 100 course. Today we're going to be talking about China and I've titled this lecture China's Eternal Quest for Unity because kind of the main theme of Chinese history is this pursuit of a unified central state of China. To give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to start with just a broad look at China's culture and geography, and uh, we're even going to look a little bit at modern China, uh, just to give an idea of where the story heads into the future and give you some perspective, um, just kind of ground you to the parameters of our discussion today. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Confucian thought. That's kind of the underpinnings of all of China is under, you, to understand Chinese history, you have to understand Confucianism. So just like we talked about the religions of India um, and the religions of Mesoamerica and Mesopotamia, we're gonna be talking about the philosophies that underpin Chinese culture. Um, and then we'll be talking about the historical Chinese story. So we'll look at the Qin dynasty, the Han dynasty and the Tang dynasty. Those are just three of the 24 Chinese dynasties, but they are the three most important ones for our time period. So we don't have time to talk about all of them. We're just gonna focus on those three. Okay, that's the overview. Um, so let's jump into the content. When we talk about China, we are talking about a continuum of one civilization over a span of about 4,000 years. In China, we have this united state that has survived, at least in some basic form, across history from the time of the Xia dynasty in 2000 BCE to basically the present day. There were some small interruptions and periods of disunity along the way, but always the goal among Chinese people was to bring China back to this state of unity under the authority of the emperor, who was called the son of heaven. Even in today's post-Mao China, each president of the PRC, in a way, mirrors and embodies this concept of the son of heaven. Some of you may find in your minds kind of, I guess, a disparity between what comes to mind when you think of like the history of China versus what you actually see in the news. So on the one hand, you have these images of long silk robes, beautiful curved pa roof palaces, um, emperors and royal courts, dragons and gods, and all these highly ornamented city streets that come to mind when thinking of historical China. But in the China of today that we see you know, in the news, or if you've ever visited China, it's this bustling commercial and modern communist state, and it's on the cutting edge of technology, manufacturing, and it's got this rapidly expanding economy. So what happened? How did China transform from Mulan to crazy rich Asians? The answer to that question is very long and very complicated, but it starts in roughly 1850, which is well after the time frame of our class, because um, our class ends in 1500. But I do want to give you a basic synopsis of modern Chinese history because it's just really extremely important to know um, whenever we talk about China, how, how does the story end? Uh, because modern China is very different from traditional China, or is it? We'll be talking about that. So basically, Chinese civilization has been organized under the rule of an emperor for thousands and thousands of years. But towards the end of the 19th century, when the commercial and military power began to shift towards the West, China's power began to shrink. So following two bloody wars called the Opium Wars between the Chinese and the British, China was forced to allow Western powers to come in and basically plunder China economically, uh, greatly weakening the Chinese court. From then on, the West only grew more powerful and China got weaker. Finally, World War II happened and another player, Japan, invades China. And this event completely shocked contemporary Chinese people because for millennia, Japan had been the one to be subjugated to China. And now Japan's the one invading China, causing all this havoc, chaos, and death, essentially. However, as we know, things did not go well for Japan in World War II and following the devastating dropping of the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, China was once again free to govern itself. But the problem was there was no strong government in control of the country 
and many different regional warlords attempted to fill the power vacuum and were campaigning for control of the country. So into this period of chaos after World War II steps one man, Mao Zedong. In 1949, just 73 years ago, remember, he defeated the other powers in China, uniting the country, making it a communist state, and, and he began this massive and aggressive campaign to push the country through a series of radical reforms in order to rid China of its traditional historic past and make it a modern nation. It would be an understatement of damaging proportions to say that this was done badly and often quite violently. But still, China remained an economic backwater despite all of Mao's attempts to modernize it, even the bad ones. So finally, in 1976, Mao dies and his successor, Deng Xiaoping, takes the, uh, the role of president of the People's Republic of China, and he initiates sweeping reforms that open the country, making it much more economically capitalist by bringing a more free market economy into the state while retaining the veneer and the cultural control and subjugation of being a communist state. If you asked a Chinese person today what the single most important event in Chinese history was, they would probably say this moment when Deng Xiaoping took control of China and transformed the country. That's because this event radically changed China and made it what it is today. Throughout the 1980s, China's economy flourished, its people prospered, the country finally modernized, it caught up with the rest of the world. And now they find themselves in 2022 ahead of most of the rest of the world and quickly closing in on the most powerful and successful Western states, i.e. America. So that is the story of modern China. It's the story that I've devoted my graduate and postgraduate career towards understanding. Um, and I find it to be deeply fascinating and one of the most important stories of the modern world. However, it is not the focus of our discussion today. Today, we are going to look at classical China. And throughout our story, I think you may be surprised to learn that China was actually the most powerful most advanced and most sophisticated civilization in human history, at least before the 18th century. The China of today, who struggled for decades to modernize and catch up with the West, is very different from the powerhouse of China past. Still, continuities between classic and modern China do exist, and I hope you learned today that even though the Chinese governing body is now communist and has tried to move beyond and forget its traditional imperial heritage, Ancient China still continues on in the spirit of Chinese culture, its philosophy, and its worldview. While the what of China maintained incredible continuities over vast spans of time, the where of China is surprisingly far less consistent. China's current borders are really the aftermath of imperial expansion over non-Chinese peoples that began in the Qing dynasty just about 300 years ago. And the non-Chinese people they subjugated are still quite aggrieved at that. For example, think of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang today who still very much resent Chinese rule, especially because of the human rights violations that are currently going on against them. Really interesting stuff. You should look into it if you don't know anything about it. Don't have time to discuss it at length here. Moving on. More particularly, when we talk about the geography of ancient China, what we really mean is the Yellow River Valley. That's right, another river valley, always main civilizations grow up along the river valleys of the world. So just as in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, their societies were shaped by the Tigris and the Nile, China was shaped by the primary river that its civilization grew up around, the Yellow River. Some Yellow River floods were so severe that they changed the course of Chinese history. For example, in 1048, a giant inundation profoundly altered the topography of the Northern Plain and there was a catastrophe from 1099 to 1102 that saw, I quote, corpses of the dead filling the gullies and numbered in their millions. This has been a theme throughout Chinese history. The flooding of the Yellow River changes history. It throws over dynasties. It completely alters the course of history in China. Hundreds of millions of Chinese people have died in the various cat catastrophic floods and subsequent famines and droughts that the Yellow River has wreaked upon the people of China. 
So right up to the mid 20th century, the Yellow River remained an unpredictable killer and everywhere it's left, it has left traces of its passing. China's early civilizations grew up on the banks of this river in the Middle Plain, where the fear of the breakdown of society due to natural disaster was ever present and irrigation could only be managed by a strong state. Not surprisingly then, the earliest Chinese myths about state origins are stories about the control of water, tales that focus on the mythical king, this guy named Yu the Engineer, who is super cool. In Chinese, it literally translated to the tamer of the flood. Um, but the ability of kings to organize labor, dig dikes, contain water, supervise irrigation, those kinds of things, um, seeking validation from the great ancestors, that was paramount to the survival of Chinese society. And that would be a pattern down to the end of the empire in 1911 um, and, and beyond into the Maoist era. Um, so you, the engineer, and four others are part of what is considered this mythical five emperors of China who may or may not have existed, but whose legacy in Chinese history is profound. Um, archaeologists still haven't found enough evidence that they actually existed, though, so we are not going to be discussing them greatly. Um, and there were three dynasties that existed after them, the Xia, the Shang, and the Zhou. Um, and they laid the foundation of Chinese culture and civilization for millennia. But the nuances of their emperors and dynastic traditions are just too large to fit into the confines of this class. So we are just going to focus on, as I said before, the Qin, the Han, and the Tang. Now, Still, we're not going to get into that stuff. The first thing we need to talk about is just a basic understanding of Chinese culture. It's political thought, philosophy, um, and all of that is rooted in the traditions of those first three dynasties, the Xia, the Shang, and the Zhou. Um, and it's over a span of almost 2,000 years from 2100 BCE to 256 BCE. When we talk about the Chinese civilization being one massive continuum, we are talking about a few concepts that have defined Chinese culture and governance for basically its entire existence. It's these five concepts on the page here that really stayed true of China for all of its history. And you can't really say that about any other civilization on the earth. No, no civilization has, has, lasted, has lasted as long as China and maintained such a strong internal structure. So the first idea is China as the middle kingdom this idea that they're a mediator almost between heaven above and the barbarian peoples around them beneath. Um, the, the name for China in Chinese is Zhongguo, and it literally translates to middle country, kind of capturing this idea of how they viewed themselves in relation to the people around them. They saw themselves as the pinnacle of the human race, the, the high point of what it meant to be human was to be Chinese. Now, so this idea of the mandate of heaven is that heaven has bestowed a command to each ruler of the Chinese empire to govern the people with justice and equity. And um, a king in his dynasty could only rule so long as they ruled with justice and equity, keeping heaven's favor. If they lost heaven's favor and they neglected their sacred duties or they acted tyrannically, they could arouse the displeasure of heaven, disturbing cosmic harmony and disorder would follow and society would descend into chaos, often through visible signs like natural disasters or the invasions of different armies or barbarian groups as they saw them, they saw them as barbarians. So anytime that a dynasty ended, it would typically come alongside all of these natural disasters and terrible things happening. And you'll see that in our discussion today. And the Chinese people saw that as heaven removing its mandate from a dynasty and saying, you are no longer going to be the, the dynastic rulers of China. We're going to take it away and give it to a new dynasty. And that's why you have these many dynasties within the whole length of the Chinese civilization. So different ruling families were in control of China, the, you know, the 24 different dynasties, but it was all part of this same structure. They all assumed the mantle of the mandate of heaven. Every single dynasty believed they had the mandate of heaven to rule China. They were going to continue to rule China under Confucian values, and they were going to have the emperor who was the son of heaven. So the son of heaven is this next idea that really was a thorough line, through line, excuse me, through Chinese history. Um, each Chinese emperor is called the son of heaven. 
Um, and all members of Chinese society, regardless of their many differences, whether they're Confucian, Buddhist, Taoist, legalist, whatever, all of them across history have recognized the supreme authority of the emperor and his role as keeper of the peace and prosperity in China. And that's unique because we know that a lot of different philosophers and religious people have different opinions on who should be ruling a given group. But in China, they all agreed there should be an emperor and he should be followed. But the emperor was not just an all-powerful dictator. He had to be guided by the principles of Confucianism. Now, we're going to get into Confucianism a little bit more later, but just to give you a basic idea, it's this concept of humanism and ethics, respect for authority, uh, a duty to your own role in life. And emperors had to be had to found their lives on ideas of virtue and civility. If the ruler was tyrannical, then the people had a right to rise against him. So following these Confucian principles, um, each emperor was supposed to aim to be this sage emperor, not just a political figure, but a philosopher and a teacher and a virtuous man as well. So this cultural hegemony of the emperor allowed for an incredibly powerful administrative apparatus across China. All the Chinese dynasties are marked by the strength of the centralized government of their rulers. And whenever it came to a weak point, that's when a dynasty would end and a new one would take its place. Now we're gonna turn our attention to looking at Chinese history and we'll see how these five features show up again and again throughout the whole story of China. So we're going to start in the Shang Dynasty, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the kings of the Shang Dynasty. I really want to talk about the religious and philosophical ideas of the Shang Dynasty. And this can be captured in the divination rituals and the oracle bone writings that they created um, as early as 1200 BCE. The aim of the divination ritual was to know the mind of heaven and the ancestors and the spirits of nature in order to understand and control future events. The oracle bones that were used in these divination rituals are a collection of about 100,000 or so inscribed cattle scapulas and turtle shell fragments that survived from the end of the Shang Dynasty. So those practicing the ritual would inscribe questions or requests on the bones of animals and then cast the bones into a fire, allowing the heat to crack the bone. And these cracks would then be inter interpreted to foretell the future. So along with these divination rituals, ancient Chinese religion also involved the worship of the Shang royal ancestors. They were considered to be powerful deities in their own right and also to have the capacity to intercede with Shangdi in matters of great importance. So ancestors of common people were probably also thought of as continuing to intervene in earthly life, but their ability to intervene in affairs would have been limited to their descendants. So think of that scene in Mulan when her dad is praying to their family ancestors. This idea of ancestor worship happened on a, on a local level, on a, on a on the level of the lowest members of society, but only they, they would only pray to their family members. They, you wouldn't pray to someone else's family member, even if they had a great family member, unless that member was part of the Shang royal dynasty. So the divination rituals and ancestor worship of the Shang dynasty continued on in the next dynasty after the Zhou dynasty. And the Zhou dynasty is important in Chinese history as it continued to set the Chinese foundation and their culture. Um, those five, five features we talked about, um, they were really solidified in the Zhou dynasty. But the period I want to focus on more is following the collapse of the Zhou dynasty when China entered a period infamous in its history known as the Warring States period. This was from 476 to 221 BCE. This was a time when violence and war became endemic. Order broke down, chaos reigned. And out of this age of conflict and political instability, there arose kind of a golden age of Chinese philosophy that it would define the Chinese political tradition. And among the many great thinkers wrestling with the fundamental issues of order, virtue, and justice was the most celebrated person in Chinese civilization. This great figure, he codified ideas in the 6th century BCE that would frame the Chinese government for millennia to come, um, and his name was Kong Chou. Uh, 
But in later times, he became known as Kung Fu Tzu, which is meaning Master Kong. Um, but his name was Latinized by Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century, and you may know of him as Confucius. Confucius is one of the most influential and famous figures in all of history. It has been said that no book, not even the Bible, has influenced so many people for so long as his book, The Analects, which is a collection of his sayings and has shaped the intellectual and cultural life of all of East Asia, Japan, and Korea. Confucius was probably the first to suggest the advantages of a unified rule over the Middle Kingdom. His specific message was to restore the potency of the kingship of the Son of Heaven by concentrating power on a single, wise, legitimate monarch. He believed this was the way to stop the turmoil and the breakdown of society. According to Confucius, there would need to be three things in place for there to be an ordered society. And this is kind of the essence of Confucian thought. The first was the daily practice and promotion of individual moral virtue. Uh, this concept of humaneness, or in Chinese, ren, meaning something like philanthropic benevolence towards others and concern for their well-being. So Confucian thought really is built on a foundation of humanism, and that lies deep in the heart of Chinese culture. So that's the first one. The second is that for an ordered Confucian society to exist, there needs to be a defined social hierarchy. So to Confucius, this was the concept best summed up by his teaching of filial piety. Um, and that literally means like the pious submission and respect of a son to his father. But generally speaking, this refers to the idea that all people in China are born with a role, be it son, daughter, wife, husband, youth to elder, subject or ruler. And uh, all of those in a subordinate position owed respect and submission and obedience to their superiors. Not out of tyrannical desire for power, remember, but just out of this recognition that the subordinate individual owes much to the one over them. Children, for example, owe their lives to their parents. Subjects owe their safety to their sovereigns and wives owed safety and prosperity to their husbands. So that might bother some of us that wives are subject to their husbands, but consider for a moment the fact that before the modern age, women were incredibly, incredibly vulnerable, both to predatory men, but also to poverty and disenfranchisement. So without a husband, a woman was very close to destitution at all times. Um, and that is why it was considered honorable for a wife to live in submission to her husband uh, because she, you know, owed a lot to him. But remember too that she in turn deserved the respect and gratitude from her children and she also would uh, receive the respect and filial piety of uh, the wives of her sons. So it was really important to have sons so that they could get married and so that their wives could then help you as an old woman. Um, so those are the first two ideas of Confucian thought. And the third is this idea of the emperor as a sage emperor. He was to be a proper example of a virtuous and righteous behavior um, because he stood at the apex of society and by the principles of filial piety deserved respect from all people. But he himself was also subject to the authority of heaven and thus had to maintain the utmost virtuous behavior to keep the mandate of heaven for himself and not let it be taken away. For an emperor to embody these qualities best, he would have to strive to be a junzi. This was the Chinese word for basically a gentleman. Um, the word gentleman is the best translation that we have, but it really doesn't fully evoke the Chinese sense of this concept. Um, the word gentleman in the West is kind of this notion of a man born of noble blood who carries himself with dignity and virtue. Uh, but the Chinese junzi um, did not have to be born of high rank. Rather, he just needed to be educated. So anyone in Chinese society could work hard enough to become a gentleman, a scholar. Um, but you know, that being said, the English word does capture this idea of someone of refined manners conducting themselves in all matters with grace and dignity and wisdom and rightness and uh, lots of emphasis on moral stature. So it was the goal of Confuci Confucius and his school of thought to educate and produce such men who would be the moral core of Chinese social and political order. So this is the basic 
rundown of Confucian thought, there is so much more to Confucianism. Um, this was a very basic overview, but that gives you an idea of what Confucius was looking for in society. Um, he wanted society built around these ideas, individual human morality within a social hierarchy of deferential respect under the authority of the emperor who conducted himself with the highest degree of individual human virtue. The warring states period and this do whatever it takes to win, that can continued on for you know, hundreds of years, but it eventually did come to an end. And its end brought on a new age for China. One that it could be argued has continued even to the present day. And that age began with the rise of the Qin dynasty. The rise of the Qin has been justly called the greatest, one of the greatest epics in human history. Um, like their contemporaries, um, the Macedonians, whom we learned about in week three, um, just before the age of Alexander the Great, you know, Philip II, he was beginning to take territory in Macedon. And then they took over and became the mainstream of, of Greek civilization. In the same way, the Qin state was seen as an outside kingdom, a barbarian kingdom on the edge of mainstream Chinese civilization. But in the 240s BCE, under their leader named King Zhang, they burst onto the stage of history, ended the fragmented Zhou rule and the Warring States period, and unified China. Zhang, the ruler, he then becomes the first emperor of China, and he renames himself Qin Shi Huangdi. And we'll get back to more about him later. But that name means that he was the first rightful emperor of China in the tradition of the previous dynasties. So the Qin ruled all of China for about 15 years, which is pretty short. Uh, but they were the superpower of the time, and they changed the story of China forever, leaving structures of governance that still exist today. And the way that the Qin were able to unite China was done not by Confucian means. You know, Confucius had been longing for this unity to come about in China. And that's not actually the way that it happened, but eventually Confucianism did become the reigning political thought in China. But the way that the dynastic tradition really started was through legalism and military power. So legalism is this concept or philosophy that is rooted in authoritarian government control. Um, it was an absolutely rep repressive clamp down state uh, where every person was counted in the population. There were cruel punishments um, and there was a complete lack of Confucian humanism. Now to facilitate this new order, uh, practical reforms were made that in essence have survived through China's history. First was the division of society into counties, districts, and villages. At the base, the smallest unit was a grouping of five families mutually responsible for each other's conduct. And the deputed head member was personally reliable for any crime in the family. Um, so this was one of the ways that uh, Qin Shi Huangdi was able to gain control and unite China through this fierce structured law. The second way was through his military technology. Um, he was able to develop and you know he used he didn't develop them himself uh, high grade weaponry and mechanical crossbows um, and they were able to put huge highly disciplined armies into the field um, and that was one of the reasons unification finally became possible. So in a series of rapid shock assaults, the Qin overcame their six main rivals um, with their ten thousand chariot states, and Chinese imperial history began. Uh, the speed of their success was incredible. Between 230 and 221 BCE, that's just nine years, uh, they swallowed up the kingdoms of the old warring states and followed up their military triumphs with measures to fulfill the legalist blueprint. As for the man himself, Qin Shi Huangdi became emperor of the Qin dynasty in his teens, in 247 BCE. And he's considered the most remarkable and controversial leader in all of Chinese history. Now, like all great autocrats in history, the first emperor created grandiose monuments to himself. He even initiated a gigantic construction project for his own tomb when he took the Qin throne. Um, and he used massive gigantic resources uh, to plan it and complete it. This is a beautiful tomb that he built to himself. And within it, he built the famous terracotta army. Um, this is an army and 
they're made entirely of terracotta clay and their images are now known across the world. Um, they were discovered in 1974 at the Chin Temple Complex, but it is still being excavated. We still haven't, we still don't know the extent of his tomb because um, archaeologists are afraid that if they, and, and you know, if they excavate it, that they're going to ruin it. So they've been very cautious and they're slowly going about that work. It's still being excavated right now. Qin Shi Huangdi brought on a new epoch and put the ruler at the center of the Chinese historical narrative. He created a unified territory and introduced a centralized bureaucracy and his government controlled people right down to the family group. Short-lived as it was, the Qin Empire bequeathed a legacy that has informed every period of government that followed. The Qin unified China, and from then on, for all its ups and downs, the idea of China as a unitary civilization persist persisted as the goal to return to. In the opening words of the famous Ming novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the empire that is united will one day fall apart, and what is divided will come back together again. So it has always been. After just 15 years of rule, the Qin dynasty was in crisis. Their harsh law had fomented rebellion among the people. So after the first emperor died, Qin Shi Huangdi dies, and the court is thrown into chaos because there's no proper successor to the throne. Qin Shi Huangdi had his son strangled to death. Um, so eventually, a younger son of the emperor is chosen, but the unrest and political chaos has already done its damage. So several rebellions gain ground in China, but the one that deals the final blow to the Qin was led by a man named Liu Bang, who is a peasant rebel, and he is the one who founds the next Chinese dynasty, the Han Dynasty, in 205 BCE. The Han Dynasty's influence on later history has been profound, so much so that the Chinese still call themselves Han today. Their dynasty covers a 400-year period, and there were many great achievements in Han governance and culture. In terms of the broad ethos of governance, the early Han rulers had followed the legalist leanings of the Qin. However, under a later emperor, Emperor Wu, and his successors, Confucius was rehabilitated and imperial scholars were entrusted with devising a new curriculum that would serve the state. Um, they collated and reconstructed the classic Confucian teachings that had been banned by the Qin, and they added more with commentaries on the canon created by Confucius. Um, these texts received official status under the Tang Dynasty as textbooks for schools and the all-important civil service examinations. The civil service examinations are one of the features of Chinese civilization that withstood massive changes across Chinese history. For anyone to become an official, even at the lowest level of government, they had to pass a series of exams that were based on Confucian philosophy and the classic texts of the ancient Zhou dynasty. Um, these were incredibly difficult texts and scholars had to devote their entire lives to studying them and just to pass. Um, there's lots of stories of failed Chinese scholars, men who spent years trying to pass the exams only to fail every time. Um, but the exams are incredibly important because for almost three millennia, China was founded on a meritocracy. By their own merit, anyone could earn their way into a position in government. Now, of course, there were those who found ways to buy their way into government, but the general rule was that official status was earned in China. And this is a very unique element of Chinese culture and one that Chinese people have always been very proud of. So this began a two millennia long linkage between the Confucian classics and Chinese political discourse. And it exerted huge influence over political ideas and personal behavior in traditional China. This mixture of Confucian hu humanism and legalist harshness, empowered by the Confucian vision of a empire run by the son of heaven, who is the sage emperor, that would survive to the 20th century. Now, Chinese contacts with the West uh, probably had already taken place during the Qin dynasty, um, but the Central Asian world would open up even more during the Han dynasty. Beginning with the earliest Han emperors, trading activities between these far ends of the Asian continent um, began. Envoys were sent from the Han court to the far west, possibly even the Mediterranean, and could take as long as like 
eight or nine years to complete a round trip. Even the shortest ones could take several years to accomplish. But the opening of what would later be known as the Silk Roads changed the geopolitics of Eurasia. From then on, contacts were unbroken between the lands of Asia and China and the West. In around 200 CE, the Han Dynasty, unfortunately, fell apart in a civil war. The epic of the Han Dynasty and the subsequent attempts by various warlords and leaders to regain power and reinstate a son of heaven um, in a new dynasty are captured in one of China's most famous literary works, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. This is an epic fourth century novel that is set at the time of the Han collapse. And it's another one of those moments when China threatened to break apart forever. Um, China broke into two on the Old North and South Divide, um, initiating the longest period of division in history um, over 350 years after the end of the Han Dynasty. Um, and during this important time, important developments took place. Uh, first, there was a huge demographic change. Under the Han, the bulk of the population had been in the lower Yangtze River Valley. Now, the colonization of the subtropical lands of the Yangtze Valley began filling unoccupied land, clearing hillsides and forests, draining marshes, um, and developing and expanding southern rice culture. And by the 500s, the south became the rice basket of China and the major center of culture, with 40% of the registered population now living in the Yangtze Valley. Several other dynasties uh, maintained control of China after this period of unrest following the end of the Han Dynasty, but we are going to jump ahead to the 7th century, when the axis of China's history shifted as new elements came into Chinese civilizations from other cultures and the Tang Dynasty created the largest Chinese empire before the 18th century. The Tang Dynasty is most people's favorite time in Chinese history. It is considered China's second golden age, the first being the ancient Shang Dynasty. Um, the Tang Dynasty is the peak of China's arts, poetry, and technological advancements. It's a period when China, in all her greatness, went out to the world, and the world, too, came to China. So building on the administrative reforms of their predecessors, the Tang created a centralized empire with a postal system and an extensive network of roads and canals radiating from the capital to the far west and the northeast. Their cultural, excuse me, their cultural achievements in the arts, literature, and history were extraordinary. They were humane and self-aware. They were full of empathy for the world and for people, and their poetry is still regarded as China's greatest. Um, in addition to their cultural advancements, this is the time when Buddhism arrived in China, and it was perhaps the most important and long-lasting of the foreign influences that came from the Tang period, opening up the Chinese people to the rest of the world. There were also great scientific advances in the Tang Dynasty. They developed cast iron technology long before the Western world. Um, other things such as paper and printing, uh, the crossbow, gunpowder, the compass, coal as fuel, the water wheel, paper currency, the wheelbarrow, wallpaper, porcelain, fully perfected porcelain, um, that appeared in Tang times. It was this combination of minerals and clay and that was glazed at a very high temperature to create these beautiful housewares and uh, pots and things. One significant Tang emperor I want to highlight was the female Empress Wu Zhao, who lived from 624 to 705 CE. Empress Wu began her career as a beautiful concubine of both the first and second Tang emperors. Uh, they made her a consort, and then she became empress, and soon came to dominate the Chinese court. Uh, she briefly became a Buddhist nun, uh, but she was pretty restless with the pious life and wanted a greater use of her talents in government. So after the death of the second Tang emperor in 683, she was able to rule alone or through puppets and then proclaimed herself empress of a new dynasty, and she is the only female emperor to ever have ruled over China. She was denounced by later Chinese historians, but that was mainly because of sexism, um, because she was really a strong and effective, if ruthless, ruler. Uh, one of her key achievements was the expansion of the civil service examinations. She made them much more impartial and better at recruiting court officials. Um, but because of her opposition to the Confucian establishment and her promotion of Buddhism, the enemy faith, uh, 
Um, but most of all, because she was a woman in 705, she was deposed in a palace coup. So that's Empress Wu. Uh, many other Tang Empire emperors succeeded Empress Wu, uh, but by the mid eighth century, China was at the height of its power, the height of its wealth, its culture. Tang ships sailed from Canton to the Persian Gulf. Uh, merchants from Central Asia thronged in the capital. In the far west, a network of fortified towns, beacons, and watchtowers stretched out into Central Asia to protect the trade routes. Basically, things were going really well. The Tang Empire was cruising. However, disaster was looming. For starters, the emperor engaged in two ill-advised wars with really bad outcomes. And soon after, in the 750s, came an unprecedented series of major calamities, which in the end, for all its administrative solidity, undermined the Tang state. First of all, a drought in 750 led to massively poor harvests. A fleet of 200 ships of grain caught fire and were destroyed. That led to a supply crisis. And then uh, later that year, a typhoon destroyed another 1,000 boats, costing even larger amounts of grain and rice and creating even more supply issues and, and price rises and inflation. And then almost incredibly, at the same time, a fire in the capital's main weapons arsenal destroyed 500,000 weapons, crossbows, swords, and spears and such. Um, and that's not even all the disas disasters that hit the Tang Dynasty in the 750s. Let's just say it was really, really bad. But making it worse of all, the Tang Emperor, who had been a brilliant commander and patron of the arts in the first half of his reign, soon became a self-absorbed and extravagant spender in the later years. Now, famously, he became enamored of a young woman named Lady Yang, and he devoted all his time to her instead of running the empire. And the people of China were starving and suffering while the emperor was off partying in his palaces with Lady Yang. So into the weakness of the Tang state came this rough and ready rebel of Central Asia named An Lushan. Now, An Lushan's forces advanced on the Tang capital and forced the emperor to flee. So emperor flees and the capital is empty and on the way to the wherever they're fleeing to, the emperor's troops mutiny against him. And they're demanding that he needs to kill his beloved Lady Yang before they would listen to another command from him. The emperor's in chaos. They see his frivol frivolity with her as the problem, so they want it gone. So the devastated emperor is forced to obey uh, because he has to. He has to for the sake of his empire. And he has Lady Yang strangled in the courtyard of a small Buddhist temple. But he's heartbroken. And later, in extreme grief, he has her body exhumed, pulled from her grave. Um, but it has decayed so much that they, they actually keep her body from him. And instead, they send him a perfumed pomade buried with her. Um, a month later, the emperor abdicates, and he's succeeded by his son. An Lushan also dies, and over the next few decades, Tang decline increases. Um, and though the empire would last until 907 CE, its grandeur, strength, and administrative power was broken. So that is the story of the Chinese dynasty, excuse me, the Chinese empire up through the Tang dynasty. Uh, today, we looked at the five features of Chinese civilization that kind of underpin all of Chinese culture and history. And then we looked at the three greatest dynasties in uh, classical Chinese history. There is so much more to the history of China and so much more to even the civilization and culture of China, its philosophical, philosophical beliefs and traditions. But today we've covered the basics of Chinese history and I hope you learned a lot from it. Um, okay, so this week's work, uh, you have, as typical, a lecture quiz and reading comprehension questions. Uh, they're going to be due, again, Tuesday night at midnight. Um, and then Thursday, you have your third project milestone. Now, I know a lot of you are behind on this project. Um, either I asked you to change your uh, original project idea, or you might not have submitted it yet. This is the time to get caught up. I hope you used spring break to catch up on the project because... This milestone, analyzing your sources, is really, really important. You're going to be looking at all the, reading all the sources that you've collected and analyzing them and answering three key questions. I've created a whole workshop explaining how to do this. Um, so take a look at that and then submit that assignment by Thursday. 
this is going to be the main body of your rough draft. So think about you're writing your paper when you write this, when you do this project milestone. Um, don't worry too much about, you know, I want you to focus on analyzing the sources, not writing an introduction or a conclusion. So that's why I'm having you start with this, because I think writing the introduction and conclusion can often be distracting from actually just getting the argument down on the paper. And honestly, I don't think anyone should write their intro and conclusion first. Those should be the last things that they write, because really they should reflect what's in the body of the pair of the paper, not um, they shouldn't, they're not going to help you guide and think through what you want to say, because you don't know what you want to say yet. So don't write your intro, just write this kind of analysis of your sources. I have a template in Canvas that explains how to, uh, how to create this document. So use that template because it's the exact format that I'm looking for. Don't try to make this up on your own. Use my template, please. Um, okay, I think that's everything. I'll explain more on this in the workshop um, on analyzing your sources, but that's all for now. And uh, I'll see you next time.